Okay, so, so far we have Warren Chant, friend of the financial planner, and we have Jeff Bresnahan, friend of the administrator, not so friendly towards the fund managers. And talking about agreement between each other and we're not telling things, obviously, I mean, you, in the preparation for this, Alex led the charge that we would all dress casually for this session. <laughs> so you can see that consultants don't always tell each other too. So, Alex, over to you, thank you. Well, I'll try not to lecture you for half an hour. I thought this session was about you giving us a hard time, not us just sort of bequeathing our views on the world. I live in Canberra. I used to be a high school teacher. I work for a research firm and this year I've become a junior rugby referee in Canberra. I'm used to being hated. It's fine. Bring it on, as they say on West Wing. <laughs> the big theme driving our super fund community, and I, I learnt this from John O'Shaughnessy from ISFA, he said, the big theme for our community is not-for-profit funds are learning how to do this retail thing. We are no longer, notice how I said we, we are no longer protected in the way we used to be in the good old days. And to do this, you must sell your story, you must tell your story, but the first thing is you must figure out what that story is. And that's really hard. I mean, even for the Rainmaker group, as we're evolving, we've got to be evolving and reinventing our story as well. It's a challenge for everybody. This is much harder than it seems and the transition is not quite yet complete, hence the angst and hence why so many of you are pissed off with us. But we do this because you ask us to. We get phone calls and emails from members, some of which are absolutely terrifying, the questions we get from members, that, and the way they let you into their lives. I mean, if, if, what I'm, if the contacts I'm getting are anything like the ones you're getting, then life is getting scary out there. The media hassle us and increasingly planners do as well. However, it's not our job to run your funds and it's definitely not our job to tell you how to run your funds. And it terrifies me to death when I'm sitting having a yarn with a bunch of trustees or strategic marketers from a bunch of funds, whatever, and they're asking me what should they do to their funds so I'll like them more. The second trustees say that to me, I say, it's now time you ring up APRA, turn in your trustee licence because I'm not going to join your fund. Us three are not going to join your funds. The human beings, the members are going to join your funds. So work out what you're trying to tell your members. Now, it's our job to try and figure out what that story is and help describe that, but it's not our job to tell you how to do it. I mean, our businesses are a fraction of the sizes of your businesses, and I'm amazed that a group as small as Rainmaker can walk up to a mob like Australian Super, hey, yeah, we can tell you how to run your $30 billion. No way. It's ridiculous to think we can do that. But we can help work out what that story is. That is our power play. So maybe part of the problem is us researchers take ourselves far too seriously. And that's a disease that I caught several years ago, but I've, I've had therapy since. I think I've come to grips with it. Funds also not being confident about themselves only reinforces all these problems. But if fund managers have learned how to cope, I'm quite sure super funds can as well. Researchers, of course, need to understand their fiduciary role and I stress the word fiduciary. I love that word. It's a US word. I think it encompasses all of us have a responsibility when we're dealing with superannuation, with the responsibility we have. Whether we are formally the trustee is not the point. If we have some influence in this process, we are fiduciaries and we need to respect and understand that role. But blaming us because you don't know your story and you're getting frustrated because other people are doing it better than you, that's not our problem. Thank you. Well, we know who Warren's aligned with, Jeff's aligned with, and Alex is friend of the referees, I'd say, based on that. Okay. Um, I thought I might start this off. I mean, it was interesting. I used to uh, sort of like seeing the fund I worked for and perhaps myself even appear in the press every now and again. And I even thought I was rivaling Warren Chant there for a while in terms of coverage. But I tell you what, no one, no one can match what Jeff Bresnahan seems to get in terms of coverage, which actually is a two-edged sword. 22nd of January this year, the ASX 200 dropped 7%. Who do they ask for comment on? Jeff Bresnahan. A couple of weeks later, there's a credit crunch article and there's a credit crunch, a lot of stories going around. Who do they ask an opinion on? Jeff Bresnahan. The RBA interest rates, they jack up interest rates a number of times over a short period of time. Who do they ask how that will affect consumers? Jeff Bresnahan. I haven't checked on Bear Stearns yet, but I'm pretty sure Jeff will have something to say on that as well. <laughs> Jeff, as I said, it's a two-edged sword. I mean, really, 
the weekly publishing of super ratings tables and as Warren said we see these same funds cropping up and up and up and I live in hope that I'll see my fund there one day before I pass on. You know. um, are you really helping or are you hindering? Because I think you're worrying a lot of people unnecessarily. I mean if it could be done daily I'm sure you'd put daily tables in there too. Things first, I think um, you know. First date paid us a lot more money. You'd see your results higher in the table. Um, <laughs> look, the, the issue of reporting, whether it's monthly, um, quarterly, whatever, it's it's a two-edged sword. But this is a great example this year. We are, as I said, we, we're pretty guaranteed to have a negative return this year. So if people don't want us to report on the way through, what happens? The consumer, come August, September, October, gets a statement and says, "Thanks very much. We lost you three and a half grand." No forewarning, no foresight, people don't understand their imbalanced options, all they get told is minus 6%, thanks for coming. And look, that's an issue. The, the, the media coverage, I actually think, is a good thing because it, it um, gets people understanding of what potentially could come. There's several things here. As I said, most people don't understand what a balanced fund is. They do not understand that a balanced fund can be negative. And that's part of the education with the media. I actually think the media has been tremendous this year and, and late last year in when we've discussed it with them, we said, look, here are the short-term effects, but here are the five-year numbers and they're the numbers that count. And just about every media outlet we, I've spoken to on that basis has run that line, which I think is a wonderful thing because it's saying, yes, you can lose money in the short term. That is the nature of having equities and alternative investments in the portfolio that you're not aware of, but look at your super fund because even after all of this, it has still delivered you 50-something percent over the last five years. So from that front, I, I don't apologise for um, talking to the media, for giving short-term results to the media. The, the key thing there is we've never published a fund result over one month, three month financial year to date with the exception of as it approaches the end of the financial year, so around about Feb, March, April. Um, but you'll never see a fund result at one month. You'll never see a fund result over three months because they are totally irrelevant. What we're trying to say there is, in a particular month, yes, the, the super fund has dropped 3%, or in January, 5%. It is a big number. Um, and over three months, we've done such and such. So that's all I'm saying. It is, in my mind, um, educating. It's part of that whole educating process of the Australian consumer who knows bugger all about superannuation, and we're not that far advanced. However, with the media support that's happened over the last few years, I think we're much further advanced than we probably otherwise would have been. Warren, when I, uh, I spoke to you recently and I actually copied down your words of wisdom uh, about sort of how to disclose negative returns or poor return periods, and you said to me, and I, I copied this down after the coffee, simply explain the reasons for the lower 2008 returns, put them in context over the historical long term since 2000, and outline your expected returns over a normal business cycle. Do not discuss this with your lawyer. They are like barnacles on the bum of progress. Just tell the truth. Have some courage. Imagine you're explaining this to your nearest and dearest relative. Apart from your view of lawyers, um, do you really believe that? Do you believe in our world we can do that? Well, yes. yes okay, that's good. That's Alex. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I think, look, I... My comment on, uh, on lawyers, I mean, in a way, they're kind of the bane of our life and even the lawyer, the very prominent lawyer who was talking to us yesterday, and he was very entertaining, you know, he kind of uh, intimated that you know, people don't particularly like lawyers. In our industry, I, I just kind of think that um, when you look at PDSs and how big they are and so forth, I mean, lawyers made the law and you go to lawyers and get advice and they're the ones that kind of give you advice on you know, what you can and can't have um, in a PDS and so I, I am very critical of them and um, it's, it's just in lots of things that I think that funds would like to just come out and be honest about in disclosing things uh, and frequently I think or more often than not the advice from the lawyers prevents you from doing that because they're concerned about your liability, they talk more about liability. You know, the whole question of giving advice, I mean um, be because of the research that we do and Alex is the same and Jeff's the same we get a lot of inquiries from the public, um, a great many inquiries from the public. And they're in many cases, you know, they're, they're fairly simple um, inquiries. And in some cases, they're more complex inquiries. But generally, it kind of relates to, am I in a good fund or not? And in a sense, who's in a better position than we three to answer that question? 
But whenever I answer that question, in the back of my mind, um, we've actually got a licence to give advice to, to retail investors. But in the back of my mind, I'm always kind of wondering, is this someone's shadow shopping uh, for ASIC or AFRA? Um, or is this a fund uh, checking up on, on sort of the, the advice that, that we give? Um, and, but the thing is, I'm concerned, I really want to help them because I feel no one knows better than we three um, about funds. And I really want to help them, but I always feel somewhat constrained. And, and I guess it's that frustration um, that I sort of feel with the law and, and, and lawyers. But in terms of the, you know, your, the negative returns, I couldn't agree with Jeff more in terms of you need to be honest and you, and you do need to explain it. Um, and I know, you know, almost no matter what you do, it'll be very hard for people to understand why they've got a negative return, but doesn't stop you from really trying hard. You know, it's amazing you know, when we're having a chat beforehand, these three were actually miffed that Nick Sherry didn't invite them onto the Superannuation Advisory Committee. They said, we're the only truly independent advisors who give him accurate advice. I said, come on, mate, give us a break. I said, if you did that, it'd be the first pro bono job you've ever taken on, you know. <laughs> Alex, um, Alex, I wanted to ask you, you often use the term you're a research house as opposed to a ratings house. And I, I get the feeling in dealing with your organisation that you know, research is a big part of your role personally and you've got a passion for research. I mean, could you just give us some insight into your approach to ratings versus research and, and perhaps some of the, the issues that I know you've been criticised for in terms of ratings agencies and research houses getting a bad name? Well, I think ratings is just a score at the end of the day. I mean, how, how do you come up with that score by trying to wrap your mind around what makes that fund work? I mean, how, the biggest challenge in this market space over the last probably decade has been just trying to figure it out. We started working out how to get our head around measuring fees about seven or eight years ago. The reason we did that is we started doing crediting rate surveys because BRW magazine would do them with us. You can't really talk about performance unless you talk about fees, but oh my God, how do you work out those key feature statement things that were around at the time? Oh, well, maybe we need to come up with a conceptual framework because if we can't explain it, then we don't understand it. If I don't understand it, I can't get up here and give a yarn about it and I can't tell a consumer or tell a fund about it. So we developed a framework. So if we're going to come along and rate someone on fees, which we don't, but if we were to rate someone on fees, we therefore need a conceptual base to, to, to be the platform of that thinking. If we're going to start talking about performance, we need to then do lots and lots of research to work out there are lots and lots of ways with which people talk about their performance. One of the most mystical things about this industry is the word performance has about 1,917,400 meanings. And w we think we've sketched out a pretty easy way to talk about these things because this industry is wonderfully simple. We've just made it really complicated because we seem to think that everyone needs to know all the compliance rules. I don't care about the compliance rules in my house. I just want to make sure it's got a couple of rooms and the roof won't fall in this weekend. We've gotten over-obsessed with something. So we, have, we call ourselves a research house because that's where we've come from. We do our ratings as a reflection or as an expression. That's a great word. As an expression of the research we have done. In doing that, we, we have a, a framework which is not so much a scorecard approach. I could come along and rate a fund being really good because it got top returns in its balance fund, but it's another fund I could say they're really, really good because they've got a fantastic menu. One of the things we've had to get our mind around is different funds do different things for different people for different reasons in different contexts. And so having that research base, I think, means that we can actually start talking at this level. And we find when we talk at this level with people, we actually have very simple conversations. So I hang my hat on being a research firm. The rating is the expression of that. And it's probably my, my legacy as a... Everyone's into education in this industry. There's a great line from West Wing where during the campaign one of the spinners says, what is it about your liberals? You're never happy unless you're educating the public. And I think we've got that disease as well. We're constantly educating people. I don't think we've worked out what that word actually means. A fund manager to me yesterday, we're, in the, we're doing road shows with financial planners in Orange and now that town is going ahead like you wouldn't believe. But um, there's going to be the, the gold mining centre of the Central West and there's truffles growing in their backyards. But what if this fund manager said, oh, this education thing, no one knows what it means, but I reckon I know the real reason, Alex. And I said, oh, what's that? And she said, well, I'm giving it away now, but she said, what education means is 
trying to convince people that when they want to take their money away from us, we convince them to keep it with us because we want to suck more fees out of it while we've still got it. That's what education means. I thought that was the best definition I've heard of it. But we, we come along and we talk about our research heritage because it helps us understand if we're going to talk about your fund to you and to other people, we need to try and understand how it works. And so I'm a researcher and because I used to be a school teacher, I just love explaining things to the point of a nauseam. It's just something I've got. Thanks, Alec. Jeff, administration. Um, can you tell us from your, I mean, you guys all make money out of reviewing administrators uh, and there's not that many of them, so is there really that much difference between one versus another? Ask that question in this audience. Yeah. You might make it to the door on the way out. Yeah. Yes, there is. There's a world of difference between the, the, the best uh, administration platforms and the worst. And um, look, it's a key issue. And one that, that obviously is getting addressed. Um, as far as, you know, if, if you look at the administration's outsourcing arrangements at the moment, there's four key players. Uh, I'm sure two of them want a duopoly and they'll push pretty bloody hard for it in the short, short time frame. But those four have very different capabilities in what they can do in terms of systems and delivery, the timing on it, um, the actual underlying um, processing system in all cases works and it's got scale. Um, but they're very clunky, you know, they, 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 some of the funds can implement things very quickly. So in other words, if you change your fund structure, it can be, depending on your administrator, implemented very, very quickly or very slowly or very poorly. It just depends on what your administrator is. So, look, it is a key issue and, and we know that the funds have not invested enough, sorry, the administrators have not invested enough money. We also know that, you know, AAS is probably the best example, is pouring money in there right at the moment to get Aspire up and running. Um, it remains to be seen. Look, if it works, good on them because they've poured a lot of money into that. They need it, needed a new operating system. Um, you know, super partners going through a review, major review, um, needed to be done. You know, it, all of these administrators face challenge. Pillar use off the shelf stuff as opposed to proprietary system. So they're all different. Um, and it, it is a key issue for all of these funds because it determines how you interact with your membership going forward. Is it in our interest to have four? Um, if you talk to John McMurtry, he will say no. <laughs> um, yeah, but he'd say one. No? Yeah, you know, John would settle for two, I think. Um, oh, it's a hard one. I'd, I'd, probably, I'd probably say that the two would be sufficient in an outsourcing arrangement. I mean, the interesting part to me is, is there going to come a point of time, A, where someone actually introduces some, some wonderful technology which is flexible and scalable, because that's the issue. You've either got flexibility or scalability, not both. But will there come, if, if someone does introduce that, do you think an Australian super with $30 billion would be running down the road and buying it? If I ran Australian super, I'd be first in the queue. If you ran Australian super, I'd cancel my membership. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm a member of about 14 funds, I think, so. so might as well. Well, Warren, that brings us to the point of uh, mergers in many ways. I mean, again, when we had that coffee a few weeks back, you were suggesting that our fund at $16 billion should be looking around for partners. Um, I mean, we talked about administrators, whether or not there'd be four or two. What's your view on super funds? You know that. <laughs> yeah, but maybe somebody else doesn't. Our view is that um, super funds with assets of $5 million or less basically shouldn't be in existence. Five billion or less. So we think they should be merging. We think that super funds between five billion and 15 billion should have an extremely good reason um, not to merge. They should have an extremely good reason to have their own existence. And what I was saying to Michael was that super funds of over 15 billion should really be working with those smaller funds to make the marriage happen. Why do we say that? Um, when I talk to CIOs, sort of anecdotally, sort of the, the feeling is that 15 billion is about a sweet spot for getting all the economies of scale you're probably going to get um, in terms of fees and diversification. And I think that all you have to do is to look at the extraordinary success of Australian super since ARF and STAR merged. Um, they've got, I mean, 
on Friday there were about 30 billion, perhaps by the end of the week there'll be 27 billion, who knows. But they are large and they have, um, they have achieved some economies of scale on investments, they've achieved incredible economies of scale on insurance, but as a kind of researcher looking at Australian super, what we've really seen more than anything else is the, um, for want of a better word, you know, the efforts of the marketing teams. Um, and so scale, we think, has given them the ability to have a budget to spend on marketing, to establish their brand, na brand name. I mean, if you think about it, the name Australian Super, it's impossible to get a better name in this country. And those figures that I was sort of quoting earlier about um, yesterday, there were 380 reports run and 180 of them were Australian Super. Of all, all the inquiries we get, many of them relate to Australian Super. People saying, you know, I'm thinking of doing something with my super. What do you think of Australian super? And so it's the way forward. You know, there was a session yesterday about, you know, are you running a business? Um, if Andre West was here, my partner, um, she would be saying that, you know, the, the most important thing going forward for super funds is establishing that brand name. And she would say that, you know, your collective marketing as industry funds. Um, probably is not the best way to go because what you should be doing is establishing your own identity. Funds of up to 5 billion can't really do that. And even funds of 5 to 15 billion can't really do that. So that's why I kind of, they're arbitrary figures of course, um, but it's really kind of the principles behind them. Like going forward, so what if you're a 2 billion and 3 billion fund with you know, 200 or 300 or 400,000 members? And there's no question that you probably, you know, the directors of that fund and the management of that fund probably do an extremely good job. But the thing is, you probably could do a much, much better job if you were a bigger fund. And I guess kind of what I was also saying to you, Michael, was that, you know, within this industry, there's sort of, it's, it's almost illogical the number of funds there might be covering the same industry. And you say to yourself, why don't they merge? Why don't they get the economies of scale? And all you can ever come back to is, well, are the directors and is management more concerned about themselves than they are about members? It's just a question I pose for you.